Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Paul's Odyssey, Acts chapter 27, in our continuing study of the book of Acts. Paul, in his second epistle to the Corinthians, describes some of his travels. He says, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. We're going to only see one of those times. A night and a day I've spent in the deep, that is, in the ocean, no, no benefit of a ship. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers from among false brethren. And as he writes this, Acts chapter 27 had not yet taken place. That, <laughs> that could be added to his list of adventures. So back in chapter 28, verse 1, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, remember Paul is being held in Caesarea, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Verse 2, and embarking in an Adramethian, excuse the, the pronunciation, ship, which was about to sail for the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian, of Thessalonica. So they're they're heading out from Caesarea. Now, did you notice you have the plural used? Uh, back in chapter 16, beginning in verse 10, where Paul had been traveling and he had seen the vision uh, of somebody, a Macedonian, uh, saying, come here. Uh, immediately, we sought, notice the plural, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. Luke had entered the picture back in in Acts chapter 16. Again, we saw that that plural use, chapter 20, verse beginning in verse 5 and going all the way to verse 15. Uh, but these had gone ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. So Luke had again joined the party uh, for that uh, Acts chapter 20 section. Then there's Acts chapter 21, when we had parted from them and had set sail. This is after Paul meets with the Ephesian uh, elders uh, in, in Miletus, and uh, they go on the next leg of their journey, taking them down to Jerusalem. Um, when they're in Jerusalem, when they're in the temple, Luke doesn't use the we. He's not with Paul at that point, but he's going to, he's going to come back and be reconnected for this voyage. So chapter 27, verse 2, and embarking in an Adramitian ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea. Now Luke is a fellow traveler with Paul as he goes through this this seagoing adventure. Verse 3, the next day we put in at Sidon. Sidon is, um, notice uh, you go up the, the coast from Caesarea, you've got Tyre and then Sidon. These are all Phoenician cities. And Julius, he's the he's a centurion, uh, the one who has charge over Paul. He treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. So notice he's officially under arrest. But it's sort of a house arrest. It's, it's, you know, Paul's allowed to go and stay with his friend's house um, and, and link up with Christians there. Um, it's, it's, it's not a burdensome, uh, here I'm going to keep you chained. Verse 4, from there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Um, remember that the Romans... Uh, were not exceptional sailors. Now, they were, I have to say this, they were better than the Egyptians, but everybody was better than the Egyptians. Um, but uh, th- they're, they're sailing, and also they're at the time of the year, we're going to see this later on in the story, where the weather's starting to, um, you know, the winds are going to be seasonal. The weather's obviously seasonal, but so are the winds. And uh, they're going to the east of Cyprus just because the, the winds are not favorable to the way they would like to go. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia, Cilicia is where Tarsus is, and Pamphylia, that's, that's even further to the, to the west, we landed at Mera in Lycia. Verse 26, there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship, now, Alexandria is in Egypt, and you heard me say something about Egyptian sailors. Well, but 
a sailor from Alexandria wouldn't be Egyptian, even though Alexandria is in Egypt. He would be Greek because Alexandria is a Greek city, remember, uh, founded by Alexander the Great. And, and it was largely, even though there were, I'm sure there were Egyptians living there, um, this is an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard, and probably quite a large ship. We're going to see the 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 number of how many people are on board. This is not just a, uh, a little outboard, you know, with, with a handful of people. Uh, they've got um, several hundred people that are aboard the ship. When we had sailed slowly for a good many days and with difficulty, so um, yes, they're sailing, they're making their way west, but their issues uh, had arrived off Nidus, um, that's in chapter 27, verse 7, and the rest of the verse goes, since the winds did not permit us to go further, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, off Salome, those are the, the Straits of Salome uh, on the eastern side of the island of Crete. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lassia. And this is on the southern, southern side uh, of Crete. Verse 9, when considerable time had passed. So they've, they set out probably in the late summer. Uh, and now, but now some time has passed, and the voyage was now dangerous. Um, in fact, it was the practice among many of the sailors not to sail at all in the winter. Uh, so once the summer was passed, uh, the the weather was starting to get bad, the storms were starting to arise, and they would just that you know whatever port you were you were in, you would stay there uh, throughout the winter. Notice uh, the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast. Now, when he refers to the fast, that's that's the Day of Atonement. Uh, so that's uh, September, maybe early October, uh, and it was already past. So they're, they're already into the in well into the fall by now. Paul began to admonish them uh, and said, "Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives." Now, is Paul speaking prophetically? Or is he speaking by way of experience, the experience of a uh, somebody who's traveled on the ocean, somebody who's been shipwrecked a few times, um, according to Second Corinthians? And and we're not told, so I don't want to say that this is a the voice of prophecy. But Paul suggests that to them. I see, I perceive that this is going to be problems. Verse eleven. But the centurion was more persuaded. Remember, we had seen back in a previous chapter how that Agrippa II, before Paul, was almost persuaded to believe the gospel. Well, the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what Paul, what was being said by Paul. And the captain <laughs> said, oh, it's no problem. We can do this. <laughs> I'm reminded of a story, and I'm not going to go into it right now, but Paul and I, uh, we were down in the Caribbean, and there were some issues aboard this it was a rather large vessel um, that we were on. And uh, Paula said, uh, don't you think maybe we ought to radio for help? And uh, it was these uh, three Australians uh, that were the crew. And they said, oh, no, we can take on lots more water than this. Well, their words were prophetic. Uh, This big vessel we were on ended up capsizing out in the middle of the ocean. And uh, it was quite an adventure. Nothing like what Paul went through. No, it wasn't a storm. It it was a big deal. But it was our much smaller version uh, of that story. Verse 12, because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision. And again, notice they're listening to the captain, the pilot, and now the majority. And let me just say, sometimes the majority can be wrong. (laughs) Um, And they were here. The majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they could reach Phoenix, there was a city to the west of Fairhaven, still on Crete. Um, a a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest. And because of the way the harbor was oriented, it would would protect the ship from from the storm and the winds and the waves. And so they're looking for a harbor in which they can find a safe anchorage uh, to weather out these, these months of danger. Verse 13, when a moderate south wind came up, a wind coming from the south, uh, supposing they had attained their purpose, oh, finally, the wind's going the way we want it to go. They weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete uh, close, and then our translators um, included the word inshore. That's the idea. They're, they're following the coast, not to get too far from land, hopefully to, to reach that port and, and arrive at safety. 
Verse 14, but before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind. Now, uh, animas is, is when, in fact, we have this instrument called an anemometer that measures the speed of the wind, and a tofinikas, uh, uh, a wind that, that can just overwhelm and be victorious, called uh, uraquilo. Now, that's an interesting word in itself. Uh, Uras is the word for an east wind, and then aquilo is actually a, a borrowed Latin term, So, and that describes a north wind. So uh, we would say a northeasterner, um, and that means a lot to people who are or sailors. A, a northeaster is a, uh, that can be uh, a wind that just comes out of the north, the northeast, and, and brings storms, and this is what's happening here. Indeed, that east wind, that Euros, is mentioned, and I'm going to make reference to it later in the Aeneid, where there's a story of a shipwreck that takes place there as well. Uh, well, uh, they run into this wind. It, it, it's even got a special name. And when the wind, when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clada, Clada is to the south of uh, south of Crete, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they had hoisted it up, they used the supporting cables in undergirding the ship. They're trying to hold the ship together. And fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Citrus, they let down the sea anchor we actually have found. And, and I was at, we were in a little museum in the Aegean and came across this uh, sea anchor. I took a uh, snapped a big picture of it, uh, a Greek sea anchor, just a big rock uh, that that had tied off. And the idea was by throwing this, it would give some stability to the ship where it just wouldn't turn broadside into the waves and have the waves just roll the ship over. So that's really the challenge is, is to have the, the waves hitting the ship stern to stern instead of broadside. Uh, when the waves hit broadside, they, the ship rolls. And so they're just trying to stop the ship from ro rolling. Um, and so they used the supporting gables, uh, fearing they might run aground in the shallows of citrus. They let down the sea anchor, and in this way, let themselves be driven along. The anchor is not going to stop the ship. It's just going to keep it uh, sort of pointing in, in a line where it won't roll over. Verse 18, the next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. Now, they, they begin the process. They're not going to complete it quite yet. Uh, and on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard, uh, the tackle of the sails and, and all the lines, anything with weight, uh, overboard with their own hands. N since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned each day brings a new disparity, a, a new lack of hope, a new resignation. Verse 21, when they had gone a long time without food, after all, if you've ever been seasick, and I've had a few twinges along those lines, uh, I've never been violently ill, but, but uh, it doesn't take much to get me um, at least feeling a bit queasy. Uh, when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice. <laughs> this is Paul's, I told you so. And not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Remember, they've, they've thrown off, thrown away most of the cargo. Um, and that was the whole purpose for, for sailing, was to try to take the cargo to a new port. Verse 22, Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Wait a minute. The ship is what's keeping us afloat. How can you say there's going to be no loss of life if we lose the ship? You know, we're out in the middle of the, of the sea. For this very night, an angel of the God whom I belong, and so this has been revealed to him, uh, and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all who are sailing with you. So God is going to save Paul, and because... The other people are in the ship with Paul. They're going to be saved too. They're sort of the, uh, um, they're going to benefit from being with Paul. You know, sometimes unbelievers benefit from being with believers. And, and that's the case here. Therefore, the angel says, keep up your courage, men, 
And Paul's telling them this, um, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I've been told, but me, but we must run aground on a certain island. So, so Paul apparently had been told even the travel plans. But when the 14th night came, and we're going to come back and look at that number, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, in, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. And so they have traveled, notice they're in the Adriatic now, um, they have traveled from Crete uh, halfway across the Mediterranean. Uh, they don't know it yet. They're not going to find out until the next chapter. The land that they are approaching is an island called Malta, south of the island of Sicily, out in the middle of the Mediterranean. They took soundings. That's when you throw a rock with a, some sort of uh, rope to it, and you're trying to find, find out how deep it is. And they found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little further, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Uh, as time goes on, it's getting shallower, which means they're getting closer to land. And so here they are. Uh, notice the, the reference to a fathom. Uh, the Greek term here is an orgulias. Um, orgeo is to stretch out. And so um, it's, the, it's the, the distance from one fingertip to the other fingertip when you just stretch out your arms. Uh, for me, that's about six feet, maybe an inch or two longer than that. I'm six feet tall. And normally, what just a, a sort of an interesting point for, for most people, uh, when you stretch out your hands from fingertip to fingertip, you're going to get the same distance as tall as you are. So we, it could be, um, you know, a fathom is six feet, could be six feet, could be a little bit less, depending on how tall they were, how long is their fathom. Fearing that we might run aground, because it's getting shallower, uh, somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wish for daybreak. They can't see land, but it's getting shallower, and so they think there must be land approaching. We'd like to see where we're going. Maybe we can not crash on rocks. Maybe we can land somewhere where it's safe. Maybe we can even save the ship. Verse 30, but as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense to, of intending to lay out anchors. So uh, they say, we're going to lay out the anchors, but really, <laughs> they're going to abandon the ship. And remember, these are the only ones that know how to control the ship to any degree, as much as it's able to be controlled. Uh, everybody else on board, uh, they don't know the first thing about navigating a ship. And, and Paul sees this. Verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be safe. If they leave, you're going under. And that will be the end of it. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. So they, they cut away the way of escape. They're either going to be on the ship or they're going to drown. No other way. Sometimes we have to say, look, I'm going, and I've told my grandkids this, you know, you hold on to Jesus. There is no other way. You hold on to them, to him, no matter what. Now, the soldiers, they're not thinking about Jesus. They're just cutting away the ship's boat. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you've been constantly watching and going without eating. Now, the storm had been a little bit longer than that, but, but 14 days now uh, in the height of the storm, having taken nothing, therefore I encourage you to take some food, uh, for this is your preservation. Now, when he says this is your preservation, um, the Greek word there is soteria, uh, where we usually translate your salvation. Preservation works. I'm not arguing with the translation, but I want you to see it's a, a word we've seen to describe salvation. And, and I think maybe, maybe there's something that echoes as we see about salvation and food and, and 14 days. Um, what happened on the 14th day that involved a meal um, and salvation? That's, that's Passover language. Now, it wasn't time of the Passover as, as we're in the story. But these elements in the story sort of remind us that there was an earlier story where God moved in the midst of, of bad situations, in the midst of the angel of death. And in a sense, they're all, looking, they're all facing this prospect of death. And yet he says, no, take and eat. Now, he's not having the Lord's Supper, but, but it reminds us a little bit of the of the, the Passover, that event where God had saved his people. And he says, for not a hair from the head of any of you will, will perish. You're all going to be delivered. And having said this, he took bread 
and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it. <laughs> and I got to say, that reminds me of Jesus. Who Now, we don't have a reference here to bread and wine. So, again, I'm not sure that it, I don't think necessarily this is the Lord's Supper, but it reminds us of Jesus. And he broke it and began to eat, and all of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. Now, this is, this is quite a large ship and quite a large contingent of people. Now, that's not unknown. Josephus actually tells us about a ship that that uh, s- that sank out in the uh, Mediterranean with 600 people aboard. So, you know, they, they had some fairly large ships, and frankly, I think maybe we're <laughs> overpacked a bit, and that might have been the case here. But 276, um, I don't see any symbolism in the number. Uh, it's just, it's it's a large group of people. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. They'd already tossed out quite a bit of the cargo, but now the wheat, the food, <laughs> um, and, and now they're throwing that overboard as well, anything to save their lives. When day came, and by the way, the picture you're seeing here is actually taken. Uh, it's a lighthouse in Malta, the <laughs> same place where they're going to crash. When day came, they could not recognize the land. But they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach. Notice how the tension in the the storytelling is getting higher and higher uh, they're getting close to the land. They're loosening the rudders. They're getting the beach is coming up, but striking a reef uh, where the two seas met. Now the Greek word there is a tapas, uh, so it's not actually there's not a, actually a separate word for a reef, uh, a place where the two seas met, which probably has you know rocks or reef. You know, uh, remember this wouldn't be coral necessarily, but uh, but so, some sort of outcropping of rock. Where the two seas met, they ran the vessel aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. So this ship has run aground, and it is breaking up, and and it's, you know, they're losing ship fast. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. So the soldiers have one plan, but the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to the land and the rest should follow some on planks, others on various things from the ship, you know, whatever whatever will float. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. So notice the soldiers had their plan, the centurion had their plan, and so it happened. So, you know, I I think what happened is God had his plan. Uh, A friend of mine, Coach uh, Mike Jarvis, um, and if you're into sports, you might have heard his name. Uh, I'd, I'd never heard his name until I met him, and, and we became good friends uh, over the years. Uh, he likes to say, and he probably got it from someone else, uh, he likes to say that man plans, God laughs. And, and I think that's exactly what's happening here. There are plans afoot, but God has his plan, and that's the one that comes to be. Now, we come to the end of the story. They, they've landed, and we'll pick up in the next chapter what happens on the beach. But I want to ask the question, why is this story included in the pages of the Bible? And not just included. We could have told the whole story. You know, Paul sailed, the ship ran into the storm, and it shipwrecked. But we, instead of telling the story in just a few verses, we go through an entire rather good-sized chapter in telling the story and so really, why is the story told in this detail? I think that's the bigger question. And I want to suggest several reasons. Uh, first of all, because it happened, and, and so I'm not denying that. But there are other things. Remember, we read that Paul had been shipwrecked a few times before this, and yet those stories aren't even mentioned. Uh, so yes, it happened, but I think maybe some other reasons as well, uh, to show the struggle involved in spreading the gospel, where God is bringing Paul to Rome so that the readers of this book, of the Acts of the Apostles, um, can can hear the story and know what it took to bring the gospel to them, where they can hear it and, and read the story. Uh, and, and it shows the storms. Uh, we, we've seen lots of 
of uh, what we call, could call virtual storms, storms of people, storms of persecution, and, and now actually a literal storm, uh, to picture God's saving providence. We just noted that, that, uh, that men plan and God laughs because God has, he has his own plan. Um, but also, I think maybe to complete what I've called the centurion theme in Luke's multi-volume story, because remember that that Luke is the first volume and Acts is the second volume, and Luke has seen this story at least at times, yes, through his own eyes, uh, yes, through Paul's eyes, but also at times through the eyes of certain centurions. Now, remember, a centurion, he's a Roman official, but he's sort of on the lower rungs. He's not a uh, a kiliarch, which would be a ruler of a thousand. Uh, remember, we we used that term for commander um, earlier in the book of Acts. That, but this a centurion was over a hundred, so we would think of him maybe as a master sergeant in today's military. And there's there are a number of stories that that Luke has given us. He's talked about the centurion who asked Jesus to heal the servant back in Luke chapter seven, and then at the crucifixion there was a centurion at the cross who says, "This man is innocent." Uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 47. And then here in the book of Acts, we've seen, we've seen Cornelius and his story and how he had sent uh, for Paul and Paul had come to visit him in Caesarea. And, and this centurion, Cornelius, had actually become a Christian. And finally, the centurion of which we're speaking, this Julius, the centurion from the Augustan cohort, uh, he's with Paul, and, and he's uh, listening to Paul and sometimes saying, yeah, okay, that's good, and sometimes disregarding him. But at the end, uh, he, has, he has listened to Paul, and he has come safely through with these others who were with them. And so there's a sense in which, uh, if you doubt the report, <laughs> go ask Julius, who is going to accompany Paul all the way all the way to Rome. Why is this story included? I think those are aspects, but maybe, and, and I'm not so sure about this one, but I'm going to suggest it. You see, there were some other storm stories that were known to the Romans. Um, the one you probably are, with which you're probably familiar, is the story of the Odyssey, where Odysseus, uh, uh, the Greek traveler, and this is Homer's story uh, from 800 BC, encounters a storm that kills all his men, but he survives, and, and there's certainly a, a shipwreck story there. Um, just as familiar to them by this time is the Roman version of that story. Yes, there was a Roman version, um, and it's called the Aeneid. And it actually starts off with Troy, um, but in the beginning of the story, one of the, actually it's not just one of the ships, a, a, a number of ships um, that had uh, left with Odysseus, but have gone in a different direction. And, uh, and, and they're not ships that are, are piloted by Greeks. They are ships piloted by Trojans uh, at the fall of Troy. And uh, in, at the beginning of the Aeneid, uh, there's Aeneas, he's a Trojan. And, and he and his, a number of ships that are with him, uh, they run into a storm. And it results in Aeneas being taken with his men to Carthage. A number of the ships uh, are destroyed. A number of the people die in that storm. Um, but, and Aeneas survives, uh, thrown, you know, uh, he ends up in Carthage. And then eventually he's on his way to Italy where he's going to found uh, the people, the Latin race, and they are going to give rise eventually to the Romans. So it's, it's the Roman origin story. And here's the story of Paul also on his way to Rome. So maybe instead of the Odyssey, maybe we ought to think of the Aeneid. And the Lord brings Paul and his entire company, no one dies, safe through the storm. And so there's, there's a sense in which uh, these other stories are in the background, but here's the God that Paul worships, the much greater God that brings all of the people safely, safely through the storm. And they're headed to Italy too, not to found the Roman Empire or the Roman people, but to found God's kingdom, and God's kingdom is already there, it's already growing, and they are part of God's kingdom, and you can be part of that kingdom too if you come to know the, the God that Paul worships.